Um, we knew this was going to happen, and it finally happened yesterday. Woodstock 50 officially canceled. You go up on their website right now. It says our festival is canceled, but the uh, spirit of Woodstock lives on. Uh, our good buddy and uh, my best friend in the whole wide world, although he doesn't know that, David Brown, did a uh, piece with Michael Lang yesterday at RollingStone.com uh, where he actually sat down with Michael Lang and asked him a bunch of questions. And we're going to go through what uh, Michael Lang's responses were. It's a great piece, as David Brown tends to do. He's always on top of things. He also did this with uh, Corey Grow. And uh, it kind of gives us a little bit of a, an idea of the uh, timeline of what happened here. So they spoke yesterday just uh, hours after the cancellation announcement was made. They asked Michael Lang what was going through his mind. He said he was disappointed that he had been prepared for the cancellation, but it was still a pretty big disappointment. He said that, uh, and I quote here, when we lost Vernon Downs, the idea of Woodstock, the festival within the vision of what I had for, it was over. Uh, it would have been, it would have had the NGOs and voter registration nonprofit headcount involved, and we could have done all the things up there. When that went away, that was the big disappointment. With Merriweather, we decided to do some good with what had, well, with what we had in terms of talent and interest and do a fundraiser for headcount. It was down to a one-day event, and we just put together an interesting lineup after going through tons of other iterations with acts that unfortunately had problems with other play dates in the market. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Uh, we talked about this uh, yesterday in the morning show with Anthony Vlog, where um, supposedly it came down to some of the artists that did want to perform, they couldn't because they had some radius clauses, meaning that they had a date in the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area at another time, and the other venue wouldn't let them uh, break that radius clause. The radius clause is where you can't play in the same location uh, within a certain mileage area in the same span of time. You know, uh, If you book a show at the Nassau Coliseum, you can't book a show at Madison Square Garden within the same month. Because in the National Coliseum, nobody's going to buy tickets. They're all going to buy tickets to the Garden. That's so on and so forth. Unless there's an agreement in place where you're allowed to do that with the venues, which can happen on occasion. Kind of Billy Joel is the only one I think that could do that, though. Um, but that that's basically what the radius clause is. So if they had an artist that was on board, they were blocked by whatever other dates they had on the schedule. Um, Michael Lang to go on to say that he wants to in the fall sometime do another event at Merriweather uh, to help out headcount. He was very big about headcount. We saw headcount mentioned in the um, announcement when they announced the lineup in that weird press conference that they had. And uh, he seemed to kind of make it all about that and the NGOs, the non government organizations, um, which I understand. Uh, what was the biggest factor in the cancellation? Michael Lang said the lateness of the confirmation of some of the headline talent that could carry the day. Just, we, just what needed to be done to put this thing together in the next week and a half, it became unnecessary to knock ourselves out and not do it right and not have the message out properly. Um, I found this to be interesting. When did the headliners start dropping out? Michael said that Jay-Z dropped out early on. So after Watkins Glen... Jay-Z was out. We didn't know that. Jay-Z didn't say, they obviously didn't admit it. Maybe they were going to try and keep him, but, um, you know, we talked about if they were going to move this thing anywhere else, they would be able to carry it because of the brand, because of the headliners, and Jay-Z alone, because of his popularity, could have sold a whole bunch of tickets. Well, they never had Jay-Z after Watkins Glen, we learned out later on. Uh, and then he went on to say that everybody else basically dropped out after Vernon Downs. So that's kind of interesting to me because it looks like they still have the support of all the artists after they lost Watkins Glen. So as negative as everybody wanted to perceive this in the media and Variety and Billboard and a bunch of other places, you know, had a whole lot of stories about how the agents were against them and saying this was a lost cause and everything else. Michael Lang, at least, is saying to the contrary. Now, again, he said, she said, right, one side and the other side. We, Michael Lang could be making this up. Those reports could have been true. I don't know, but um, it seems like from what Michael's point of view is, again, this is all we can share with you right now because he's the only one that's talking. Um, he was asked about going back to Vernon Downs four times. 
To no avail did he see it as the last straw. His answer was, I had been looking at Vernon Downs for a couple of years. When we began discussing things with the track and with town officials, we were looking at somewhere north of 100,000 people. It looked like the ideal venue. I think it still could be. We just frankly picked the wrong partner in Dentsu. They didn't really understand the business. When the agreement went at the last minute of just being a backer to a co-producer, they had input into everything that we did. A lot to unpack there. So basically, before Watkins Glen, he was looking at Vernon Downs and was looking at somewhere north of 100,000 people, which is, again, so interesting because all the reports and everything else we've had recently put the the capacity nowhere near 100,000 people. So Michael Lang has a different point of view on that. Uh, this is the first time in the interview that he blames Dentsu. You'll notice that's going to become a theme in the rest of this piece. And uh, he talks about them in the last minute going from just being a financial backer to a co-producer, which meant that they had input on everything that occurred in the festival. Um, he was asked about the comment that he made about politics coming into the Vernon Downs situation. And he said that when they first went to Vernon Downs, they were told that the permits would be issued a few days later. And then all of a sudden, it became this whole long process. I don't know why anybody would promise that. Um, again, I don't think that necessarily what happened at Vernon Downs was not warranted. It could have been politically motivated. But again, you're dealing with people's safety and making sure that you have plans in place. That's kind of important. Uh, Michael doesn't go on to address that any further, but that's important. I don't care what anybody says. Um, he was asked to walk uh, through the Dentsu uh, process and what was the first indication that that relationship had gone wrong. And this is pretty interesting. He says, and I quote here, in the beginning, they were very excited about Woodstock. They were excited about the brand. They were excited about the potential for profit. And they said they were in it for doing some good. I guess I bought into that. Once our contracts were ready to be signed and this issue came up where suddenly they had to be co-producing and had to agree on everything at the last minute. And although they assured me it was just for looks, that was really the beginning of the problems. Lesson learned. And that's on Michael Lang. You don't put things in contracts for the look. Contracts are there for a reason. They're the basis of an agreement. You don't just go, oh, that's just for the looks. You should have known right there. You shouldn't have signed that contract to begin with. They were in advertising, and they were very credible about trying to be helpful with sponsors and with media. We were not looking at them at that point for anything more than that. And then when they suggested becoming uh, the investors, as long as they were going to stay out of our way and just put the money in and leave the production to us, we didn't see that as a problem. They had no experience in this world, and that's when they suddenly, and that's why when they suddenly became co-producers and had input into everything, it went so askew. So essentially, they became uh, involved because Dentsu is a marketing company. They became involved to market the festival, and then I guess, judging by what he said here, at some point a conversation occurred where they were like, "Well, we can put the money in too and be your financial backers." Okay, sounds good okay, what's next? Well, if we're going to put the money in, we want to be co-producers. And that's where the whole thing went awry. Asked about the current legal status with Dentsu, and this is so interesting, and I didn't know this. Michael's response was, and I quote, that is a question for Woodstock 50. I'm not a partner in Woodstock 50. They license it from Woodstock Ventures, where I am a partner. They were to provide guidance and help with the production and the narrative. And that's something they're considering. They're obviously, there's obviously a potential lawsuit there, and I'm sure that they're examining that. So go to find out in all of this that Michael Lang isn't even a part of Woodstock 50. He owns Woodstock Ventures. They license the name Woodstock to Woodstock 50, which I guess is where Greg Peck comes into play and whoever these mysterious people are that license the name, and they're the ones that put this all together. I mean, this is kind of a mess. When we get through everything here, you look at this and you go, no wonder this fell apart. Look at how many cooks are in this kitchen. All of them just doing this one little thing. You need one person, one entity in charge. One thing. And they delineate and choose and make decisions and go from there. This is like a mishmash of a mess. 
you know, you're like, oh, this guy's the face. Of the, this guy's the face of Woodstock. And then all of a sudden he goes, well, I'm not part of Woodstock 50. They, those guys, uh, he didn't even say those guys. He said, I'm not a partner. They licensed it from Woodstock Ventures, which he is a partner in. Crazy. Uh, he said that Superfly, the production end of the Woodstock Festival, was hired too late and was asked to elaborate on that. He says, and I quote, we signed the deal with Dentsu on, I think, November 2nd. We had started doing a mapping of the site and trying to get all the elements that were going to have to be described in a mass gathering permit started. We should have hired Superfly the day we signed with Dentsu. It took them until the middle of January that threw everything behind schedule. Superfly was tasked with getting the mass gathering permit but they started so late, they were frankly unable to finish it up. I think that's part of the reason why Dentsu pulled out. So they're saying they agreed with every th with Dentsu on November 2nd, and it took Dentsu till the middle of January to actually hire the production company. And then it was the production company's job to file the mass gathering permit. Well, look, you're Michael Lang. You've done this before. You've licensed your name out to somebody else, and you start to see that they're not handling it the right way. You should step in then and there. You know, by the time December rolls around, you got you have to step in and be like, we need to hire a company that's going to do these permits and get this done. Again, it's kind of online if you ask me. I know it's technicalities, and you, but if I licensed out my name to somebody, I would make damn sure I had control over the situation so that they couldn't go and ruin it. After Dentsu separated ties with Woodstock Watkins Glen, uh, was still associated with the festival for many months. What was the status then? Michael Lang said the complication there was that they were contracted by Woodstock 50 and Dentsu, so nothing could really move. Both parties would have to agree, and Dentsu obviously had to try, obviously had tried to cancel the festival, so they weren't agreeing to anything. So that six or seven weeks, nobody really worked on it in terms of the government agencies. That really killed it. So. When Dentsu canceled the festival, Watkins Glen stayed with them for a little while, if you remember. And then Watkins Glen said, we have to, can't, we're pulling out of this. They can't have the festival here. They're not ready. In between that time period, Woodstock 50 and Dentsu, both not Michael Lang, apparently, they had their names on the contract, so they had to figure it out. And, and Dentsu was in no hurry to help them out there. This is something we actually did address at the time. I mean, it's a nightmare. No wonder this thing fell apart. But Watkins Glen still, through all that, wanted to make it work. But because of the way everything was situated with the licensing and all that, it was a mess. It was a mess. There was a majority financial backer who did join things late. Michael Lang was asked about the $18 million that the court said Dentsu did not have to return. Remember, Dentsu pulled out $17, $18 million from the bank account when they canceled. He said, we were fully financed and ready to go, but you need the paperwork. Part of the financing was coming from Oppenheimer. A majority was coming from a private investor who shall go nameless at the moment until he tells me it's okay. That tells me that was somebody definitely very famous and somebody we know that is in the public light. But where's the line between your own personal responsibility for the festival's demise and the external factors out of your control? Michael Lang was asked. Nice job, David. Uh, he says, and I quote, I take full responsibility for agreeing to go with Dentsu. It was the biggest factor on why this thing didn't happen. In terms of how things went with Watkins Glen and the mass gathering work, I blame them for wasting two and a half months to sign Superfly and get that work started. That was just insane. The same thing occurred with talent bookers Danny Wimmer. Those guys were brought on to help with the booking, and they weren't signed until a week before the Christmas holiday. They did a masterful job in the time that we had. Again, we're going through all this assuming that Michael Lang is the one putting it all together. He's not doing the production end of it. He's not filling out the permits. He's not even booking the talent. And we had all assumed that when he showed up at the press conference, all like, hey, look at the talent I got. He wasn't even booking the talent. He didn't even book the thing. I mean, coming off of Woodstock 99 and what a mess that was, you would think you'd want to grab the reins on this and right the ship. You know, I equate it to Led Zeppelin and Celebration Day. They did that bad concert in, what was it, 80 or whatever for Ahmed Erdogan, Robert Plant, 
when uh, they did Celebration Day, when they had that, when they when Zeppelin finally reunited for the one day, for the one concert, for the one show, he said in the press conference, I was sitting there, he goes, we wanted to show everybody we could do this right. That last performance we did was not good. We wanted this to be the statement that everybody remembers us by. I'll never forget that. Where was that sort of mentality from Michael Lang? He goes on to say, people don't understand that there's compelling forces at work when you need to be timely and move quickly. Because they aren't familiar with things, they were very cautious and paranoid on how to move and thought they had bad I- and thought they had ideas about how things should go, which made no sense. I take that on myself. Uh, I have a lot of experience in this little area where you do a lot of the times deal with financial backers, people that have money that don't necessarily know businesses and the way that they work. And that could be detrimental. And you know what? They should have realized that sooner before they signed that agreement and agreed to take that money from Dentsu because they could have taken money from somebody else, anybody else, to make it happen, and they didn't. That was a mistake. Anybody and their mother two years ago would have been happy to write a check to Woodstock as a huge brand and a wonderful opportunity. Why would you take that money from Dentsu? I would have to assume that there was some level of greed involved, whether it was for personal gain or from the fact that they were worried about getting more money over to Headcount and all these other NGOs, whatever it was. The terms had to be so sweet because you could have gotten money from anybody. Why take the money from these people and give them a co-producer credit? That does not make any sense. That's where they slipped up. 